Why belly up? This is the game. Yeah. It's a uh, cat and mouse. Smoked a turkey. <laughs> yes. He is down. He is freaking down. Said he shot an absolute giant. Fall obsession, baby. Welcome everybody to another Fall Obsession podcast episode. I am your guide today, Fall Obsessions, Sam Thrash. And joining me today once again is my good buddy, our media production manager, Nick Powell. What's up, Sam? Glad to be here, bud. Thanks for joining me again, man. I appreciate it. Always fun to hang out with you. Oh, yeah. Every time. Every time. Every time is a good time. That is the truth. (laughs) So, today we want to talk about bow hunting. Bow hunting... Uh, and at Fall Obsession, we've talked previously about how we're wanting to build a, a wide variety of stuff and, and, and bring a lot to the table, um, a lot of diversity. And we do currently have a lot of diversity as far as our online content and what we do. But um, I know for me personally, bow hunting is, is my bread and butter. That that's, that's, the, that's where it all hits home for me. And I know you, you are up and coming as a accomplished bow hunter yeah as well (laughs) (laughs) so so uh i I thought that it would be and we were talking about this the other day too Mm -hmm. about how we were getting into bow hunting how it all started and we both have a very different journey yep um so i thought that this would be a great a great podcast to do talking about becoming a bow hunter talking about how we got into it um what people need to be thinking about or need to get if they want to get into it and kind of where it has taken us today and, and where it can potentially take our, our listeners. So um, I'll start off by asking you, how did your bow hunting journey start? So uh, where I live, I live in Collin County in North Texas. Um, Collin County is one of the most populated counties in Texas. Uh, just due to the DFW area and where it's located. Uh, so I was actually forced into bow hunting. <laughs> um, my parents own a 40-acre track of land. Um, and so it backs right up to a creek. You know, it's perfect for deer hunting. Um, I grew up rifle hunting. We'll start there. Um, we grew up going to different leases. We never hunted on this 40 acres because we've, we've been there since 99. But we never really developed uh hunting until about eight years ago uh-huh um so we grew up rifle hunting uh, at other places where in other counties that you could that you could rifle hunt collin county being so populated um they didn't even have a deer season until around eight years ago oh which, really i didn't even know that. yeah which started which caused us to start deer hunting and start you know kind of setting up stands, setting up cameras, setting up feeders, trying it out, trying it out. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, but when they started a deer season roughly eight years ago, I can't remember the exact uh, year, but they started a bow only season. So you could hunt with a crossbow or you could hunt with a vertical bow. Um, I chose to hunt with a vertical bow. Me and my dad actually went in, uh, knowing 0% about (laughs) bow hunting we actually went in halvesies on a bow at Cabela's, and we were going to split it. We are going to use it. You know, he was going to use it when he went out. I was going to use it when I went out. Good plan. Good yeah, plan. Yeah. <laughs> Real smart there. <clears throat> we had zero idea what we were doing. Um, so we got out. We got this bow. We got out in the backyard. We got a target and everything. Uh, we were warming up and, and just shooting it just to shoot it. Had, you know, we didn't watch any YouTube videos back then or anything about technique and and whatever so <clears throat> we were shooting it and the next day uh my dad said his, his shoulder was kind of hurting from pulling his bow back he's like i don't know if i'm gonna be able to do that and so then he got into the the crossbow side of things so uh that's where i got into it was Collin county finally uh started their bow season for deer and uh so i was kind of forced into it because i my dad grew up rifle hunting. He he taught me everything about rifle hunting. That's what I grew up doing. So yeah, that's how I got into it. Man, that that's uh, that, that's interesting too. <laughs> yeah. Just the fact that you one you you did it because you didn't have another choice right. if you wanted to hunt there. Um, but but two, how it is now 
a passion. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It, I love it. Yeah. It has turned into something that, that you want to do. Yeah. Whenever so. I do go hunting now, uh, my bow is my first choice. And then if I'm unsuccessful and I don't get a, a good shot with my bow, then I'll go to a gun just to make sure I fill the freezer yeah. to, to feed my family. But, um, the bow is for sure my first choice. It's a lot of fun. Absolutely. So for me, I, uh, I started bow hunting. It was because I wanted to, I wasn't forced into (laughs) it like you, but, but I had a very long journey from the point where I wanted to, to the point where I was actually capable of doing it. So I grew up hunting with my dad, my dad rifle hunted. So I grew up rifle hunting and we, we would always like part of our tradition every year, like right before the season would open like a month or two before we'd break out all the monster bucks videos and dvds oh, yeah. and, and the vhs <laughs> <laughs> and and we plug them in and and we watch them and you know a bunch of those guys bow hunt so i always i would always watch them and you know oh that'd be cool one day to try try bow hunting i might try it one day and yeah and my dad was always like maybe you know i'm never gonna bow my dad bow hunt a long time ago okay like just for a couple of years he's like i'm never gonna get into it again but maybe one day you will you know yeah. so that that was that well finally one day I was a teenager and my dad comes out and he's got his old like 1990 <laughs> bow compound bow like this Heck thing yeah. is a dinosaur and he uh he gives that to me he's like have fun <laughs> <laughs> yeah, have at it, <laughs> no no I mean I had no training no experience I was just trying to figure this thing out yeah. on my own and I have pictures of me with that bow still now and like the draw length is like three inches too long, <laughs> and I like when I first got, I couldn't even pull it back. Yeah. So I had to build up to that, and I finally got able to pull it back. I didn't know anything about draw length or anything like that, right. so I was just shooting this bow that was completely wrong for me, and I still remember my target because we we had a, we lived on a farm, so I had a, I I remember I saved up my money and bought me like one of those Cabela's block targets, mm-hmm. you know. Um, it had the deer vitals on there, so I set that out there, and I'd be shooting. And I still remember that target. You know how, you know how you have targets that get all wallered out in the center. Oh yeah. You know from from shooting it so much. That was my whole block. <laughs> <laughs> there was no center that was wallered out on that block. The whole target was like that. Nice. So I was I was nowhere near skilled enough to be anywhere close to being able to kill a deer so that's how it started for me um where my journey took a turn was with cinnamon creek so i found cinnamon creek um actually interesting how i found it too um one of the bone collector guys t-bone was going to be there for like an autograph signing or something this was the first time that i ever met him and it was at this place called Cinnamon Creek. I never heard of it before. Mm-hmm. So I went there, checked it out. And at the time, I was I was looking for, like I'd been working for my dad for a little while then, but yeah. I was looking for my first real job. You know, <laughs> I was looking for a job. Right. So um, I went in there. I was like, man, this place is pretty cool. You know, bows and archery and yeah. cool stuff, you know. So I was like, I'll apply here. So I applied there and uh, the got a job. So just part-time to start. So that helped me enter another level of the archery world. And of course the guys there are experienced and knowledgeable and everything. So they taught me and told me that everything I was doing was wrong and (laughs) that I needed to change everything. So I started saving up my money, finally bought a bow, my my first newer bow. It was actually a, a year or two old, but it was one of those bows that they that just never sold that was yeah. on the shelf it, it fit for me i liked it um and they were just trying to move it out of there so they they cut me a deal so i got i got my first real compound bow i, I put just some basic accessories on it got got shooting with that actually got reasonably proficient to the point where i could start hunting actually uh started shooting some deer mm-hmm. with my bow nice. and that turned into Later on, I got a target rig and I shot competition, the state indoor competition one year. Yeah. And then uh, got a new bow and and then it's just been an ongoing process <laughs> and getting into long range and, and coming into where we are now. So that's so, awesome. That's that that's my journey in, in a nutshell. Gotcha. So, 
Yeah, so I, I actually looked it up. Um, and Collin County's bow season started in 2012. 2012, okay. So it wasn't okay. years ago. So I was, that was a guess, but I was, it was actually it was a good right. guess. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, cool. So <clears throat> one thing that, that can be useful, I think, for, for our listeners is there's there's a lot of guys out there, there always is, and I'm, and I'm sure there are people listening to this podcast that may not have made that complete commitment to get into bow hunting. Yeah. You, I know that you recently um, got a newer bow to you. You, mm-hmm. you hung up the old Cabela's bow. Yep, and got, finally. And got something a little After bit. After about six years. Yeah, got, up, got <laughs> something a little bit better for you. Um, but you bought it, you, you were... I mean, you couldn't go out and buy a brand new bow. Right. You know, so just financially you couldn't. So um, tell us a little bit about kind of the process of going through finding your first good bow. Okay. So. Uh, so one thing I failed to mention earlier was the f- the first bow I ever bought by myself was on uh, like a Facebook online garage sale. Yeah. And... I was like, hey, this bow looks to be in good shape, knowing literally nothing about bows. I was like, this one looks looks like a good one. You know, this looks <laughs> like the one that I've seen in TV shows or whatever. <laughs> so I buy this bow, and uh, at this time I'm, I'm working at a bank. So I, I'm not working at a bow shop where there's people around. Um, I'm working at a bank, and one of my customers comes through, and he's got, like, Matthews on the back. on his. On, he's got a, a side... A toolbox on his truck and it's got like a matthew sticker and you know a bunch, these, a bunch of archery a bunch of stickers, archery yeah. entry stickers on this toolbox and um so i ask him about it and uh, he invites me to come to his house because he shoots competition and so he invites me to come to his house he says you can shoot i can show you a thing or two so i do and he actually tells me this bow I bought was a left-handed bow, and i am a right-handed <laughs> shooter <laughs> and so uh uh all in all, I end up selling this bow <laughs> yeah. because it's not going to work. Um, so, so, so f- <clears throat> the the first thing you need to do is, if you're interested in a bow, is make sure that it's make right sure or left-handed. Make sure it is the right hand uh, to your strong hand. The correct hand, not not always the right hand. The correct right. hand to your strong hand. <clears throat> if you're left-handed, shoot a left-handed bow. Yes. Um, so then, that was around uh, around the time that Collin County's uh, bow season was coming into play. So then me and my dad were like, Oh cool. We can, we can hunt this land finally. Uh, so that's when we got, we got together, got our Cabela's bow and, um, we went to Cabela's, they measured me, they measured us for our, our draw length, uh, and all that stuff. Um, got the, got the draw weight where it needed to be, uh, on this, on this bow. And we got this bow all set up, got arrows, got them cut, got the arrows cut to the right length, right length and everything. Um, bought some field tips to practice with, bought some, um, broadheads to, to shoot with. So this bow was measured for me like it should have been. Uh, when I went to, I finally, we went to paramedic school together. Yeah, we did. We went to the old medic school. Uh, it's a long six months, by the way, if any of you are going to medic school. Yes, it's a a very long six months. months. Uh, and some of them are even longer. Anyways, that's (laughs) beside the point. There was a, a guy, uh, shout out to Corey Lee if you're listening, uh, who oh Corey, oh Corey Lee, so he was selling his bow and it was a way better bow than mine because mine was a 2012 year model I think, um, his was a 2015, so it was way newer, uh, uh, but not brand new, uh, but this bow was not measured to me, so I had to kind of kind of conformed to this bow i just kind of adjusted to the bow whereas after i met you and got to talking to you a little more found out that the bow should be measured to you instead of you adjusting to the bow yes very (laughs) much so so. tip number two (laughs) when you buy a bow have that bow measured to you and adjusted to you not the other way around yeah so so on that note um i'm gonna uh, kind of dive in a little bit more on that too because a lot of people don't know how to adjust a bow to themselves mm-hmm. um different bows especially across different brands are are different ways but the the concept is on your cams which are your wheelie things 
on the end. <laughs> on the end. Those are called cams. <laughs> um, on your cams, there is a module. And that module, in, in, in a nutshell, that module is what makes your, makes your draw length. Mm-hmm. It, it's what sets it. Now, that module may be something that can actually rotate and adjust on your bow yeah. to where it can change your draw length, or it might be a piece that you actually have to completely swap out. Um, either way, if you are unsure, go to your local bow shop. Yeah. And and I'm not I'm not trying to bash big box stores or or anything like that. But I've always found, and granted, I'm again I'm coming from the Cinnamon Creek background, but I've always found your local bow shops are going to be a little they're going to care a little bit more. And those guys can be a little bit more knowledgeable, opposed to a, a box store where you got a 19-year-old kid working behind the archery counter sure. that was just that's been there for four months, and we just kind of given taught the bare minimum to make it, you yeah. know. And, yeah. and no disrespect to those, those big box stores, but if you can go support your local bow shop, yeah. is, is what I'm going to encourage you guys to do. But all is to say, if if you if you have any question about your bow, but if you need to know how to adjust the draw length, how to set the how to set the the poundage if you need to get the bow set up for you take it in there and and those guys oftentimes are, are able to help you all the time they're able to help you they'll they'll get it adjusted they'll get it set to where it needs to be and then they can we we have accessories and stuff that we'll recommend to you guys but they they will have that they will have an inventory there yeah. uh, of stuff that they can sell you right then and there or they can uh point you in the right direction if you're wanting to order something online or or something that they don't have so um on the on the subject of adjustability though is one of my favorite bows of all time the one that I'm currently running the 2020 Elite Cure. Heck yeah. Um so we are partnered with Elite Archery. Um and that new that new cure that they have is is awesome. It it is the first bow in the industry that the draw length can adjust in 1 quarter inch increments. Mm-hmm. Most bows like for me, for example, I would either need to set mine to be a, an appropriate fit, either a 29 inch or a 29 and a half inch draw. Mm-hmm. Well, I found once I started shooting the cure that my draw length is really 29 and one quarter, and I'm able to set my draw length to that specifically on yeah. that bow. So, when you're talking about a custom fit and really precision, and and, and th- this comes into effect with tuning with that cure as well, which we're trying to keep this at a more basic level, so I'm not probably going to dive into tuning too much in this podcast. But when it comes to tuning, when it comes to perfecting that bow to you, essentially, um, this bow is one of the best that I've seen. On that note, we realized that, um, like Nick just said earlier, you know, he, he couldn't, when he got this last bow that he got, he couldn't afford to go out and buy a brand new bow, which right. is why he bought it used from old Corey Lee. Corey Lee! And uh, because of that, you know, I mean, bows are expensive, and, and I'm no not going to deny that. But most manufacturers have, like, different flights of, of bows in a different price point. Elite, for example. Their Cure, last year, their Ritual, those are their flagship. Those are their top of the line. You're going to pay big money. You're going to get a good bow, but this year they the flight underneath that they have, for example, their Elite Ember, which mm-hmm. is a lower price point. It's more affordable. It is more adjustable, so it can fit a wider range of, of archers. Yep. Um, but that that is another bow that that could be uh, more of an entry level bow if you're looking for for something like that. And most, like I said, most manufacturers have that. They have their flagship, their top flight, and then they have another flight underneath that that's a little bit more. Um, affordable, yeah. uh, 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 trying to be a little bit more uh, financially acceptable for for the entry level guy. Yeah. So, and talking about bows, talking about getting into it, we're kind of talking as if I mean we have known what we wanted to shoot. Yeah. You know? But for guys that don't know what they want to shoot, maybe you've never shot a bow before and you want to get into bow hunting. Go again. Go to your local dealer because they're going to have different brands. Yep. They're going to have different bows, and they are going to let you shoot them side by side, back to back, and compare them mm-hmm. with each other. And that's the best way to find the bow that that is best for you, in my opinion. I am going to strongly encourage you when you do that to take what is called the Elite Shootability Challenge, which is where you take an elite bow and you shoot it back to back with other brands and you compare it. 
and you see the difference. You see what we talk about in our videos and, and our podcasts and, and, and online. Um, we are Team Elite. I'm not going to deny that. Absolutely. Um, we've drank the Kool-Aid. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but it, it's for good reason. And, and that's because we believe in their products. Yeah. And, and they are effective and they work for us. And we believe they are, the, the as they advertise, the most shootable bow on the market. For sure. The world's the most shootable bow. So, um, I know you had mentioned that you wanted to talk, too, about some accessories. Yeah. And, and rigging um, a bow out. Yeah, so I, I kind of just want to touch on everything that you need in order to be ready to go out in the field and take an animal. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think we should start, a good place to start would be with the bare bow. Uh-huh. Um, and just start uh, talking about, like, what all uh, the pieces and parts are. Because I know it, if you look at a bow, there's a lot of strings. There's a lot of parts everywhere. It can be intimidating. It can. If you don't know what things are. So... So let's with, let's rig one out. So Sam really nerds out about this stuff. Oh, to our I, listeners, he nerds out about it a yes, lot. Yes, I nerd out. So about I'm gonna all let him it. talk about all the <laughs> details and and what everything is called and what they do. Sam, take it away. Wow, you just put <laughs> all that on me just like that. <laughs> I'll throw some stuff in there. <laughs> all right, so you got your bow. You have purchased your very first bow you have it in front of you it's all pretty but you want to shoot it you just pulled it out of the box yes rule number one do not dry fire that thing (laughs) whatever you do that's a good one it doesn't matter what brand it doesn't matter if they say it's dry fire proof do not dry fire your bow the reason is it's not like a gun none of this is like a gun Mm -hmm. don't don't think that they're they're the same thing because they're not when you shoot a bow There is a lot of energy that is in your limbs, in your cams, and in your strings. Um, And all that energy is transferred and pushed into and through your arrow as your arrow leaves the bow. If you do not have an arrow in your bow, that energy has nowhere to go. So it is going to stay in your string, in your limbs, in your cams, and it is going to destroy them. Sometimes people can dry fire a bow and it can look perfectly fine. You take it into a bow tech and they can find some stuff wrong with it. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a bent cam, whether it's a a splintered limb. Sometimes you dry fire a bow and it blows up. It literally falls apart in your face. Yeah. Which, as much tension as is on those strings and everything, you do not want that to happen. So, rule number one, do not ever dry fire your bow. I don't care what the poundage is. I don't care what bow it is. Do not dry fire it. Yeah. So, you pull it out of the box. You're not going to dry fire it. Now you got to figure out what the heck you're going to do with this thing and what yep. you're going to put on it. So, essential accessories that you need. So, you need a sight, a rest, arrows, and a release. Those are the four things that you have to have to be able to shoot this bow to start. Um, so, the sight. Sight's probably the most simple and most recognizable thing on a bow. Mm-hmm. And, and so, that's going to go on, on the top where... It, it's hard to explain a podcast. It's easier with a visual. So, yep. so guys, we're talking about a lot of stuff here um, that may not be best conveyed through just audio. Yeah. It may be something that will work better for you to see visually. With that, I am going to go on a little rabbit trail here. We have a new series that we're, that we're going through right now on our website, on our pages, everything. It's called Cure Your Obsession. We are literally taking... Two of our own guys that are on our staff, um, brand new guys who have done next to no bow hunting at all, ever, and we are putting a brand new bow in their hands. Uh, We've partnered with Elite Archery on this. We're putting a brand new Elite Cure in their hands, and we are taking them from having never shot a bow before to hopefully this upcoming October killing a deer. Yeah. So through that journey... We're documenting everything, and through that journey, we are going to be talking about everything we're talking about now with how to set it up, what different parts of a bow are, what accessories you need, how to shoot it, proper form, proper shooting technique, all this stuff we are going to talk about in this series. So, to end my rabbit trail, go online and follow Fall Obsession because this series, if you are a new bow hunter, this series is for you. It is specifically for you. So go online and check it out. But anyway, so sight, arrest, arrows, um, a release. A release is um, what goes around your wrist or your hand on your shooting hand. So if your right hand, it's going to go on your right hand. 
um, that you pull the, it's what the tool you use to pull the bow back and to actually shoot it. So that's what a release is. Arrows, you know what arrows are. For those of you who don't, please go watch some videos. Um, the rest is what the arrow is actually going to sit in mm -hmm. um, inside your on your bow and what's actually going to direct it off of your bow, if you will. Yeah. So th those are the four things you need to be able to shoot this thing. Um, when you get it set up at your local bow shop, they're going to go through like a D-loop, um, which is what your release clips onto. Uh, a peep sight, which um, needs to be, is another part that you have to line up with your sight to be able to be accurate with the bow. The bow shop can help you with that, get those set up, get them in the right places, and get them, get them on your bow. So that's a nutshell what you need to yeah. get started. Um, on top of that, then we can start talking about stabilizers, which if you see guys with like this long bar, it's more recognizable, I think, with target archers because theirs are really long. Mm -hmm. But if you have this long bar coming off the front or even off the back of your bow, those are just stabilizers, what's just used to help balance the bow in your hand. It might add a little weight to it as well just to, um, if you really want to get technical with it, to, to help with accuracy. But... Um, and it can also help reduce some some vibration, some hand shock if you have a little bit in your bow. So that's what stabilizers are. You can get a quiver that can mount on the side of your bow. Um, bow case, um, I, I would recommend for sure just to help keep it safe and out of the Definitely. elements. Um, and beyond that, man, it's uh, you can nerd out pretty hardcore <laughs> on, sure. on archery accessories. So that that's in a nutshell. The importance of, and I'll touch just briefly on tuning, the importance of tuning a bow is just to make sure that that arrow is flying straight out of the bow because everything has to be lined up straight and accordingly and specific to you mm -hmm. and how you hold the bow so whenever you get the bow set up have your bow tech do a a generic tune on it just to get everything lined up straightened out and then after you've put about three or four hundred arrows through that bow the string if especially if it's a new bow the strings are going to break in a little bit um, which might move a few things, not to the point where you're going to visually see it, but um, tuning-wise, it'll move a few things. So then bring that bow back in, let them actually do a legit tune on it at that point after those three or 400 shots, and uh, you'll be golden. And so. on the topic of tuning, that's one thing that's really cool about bow hunting and that I think a lot of people find interesting is that that bow is catered to you. If you're shooting a rifle, you put that rifle in a shooting vise and you put that scope on the target and anybody that comes up can can grab that rifle yeah. and put the target you can go up and shoot and then i can go right behind you and shoot and it. and they can put that scope on the target and hit the target every time yeah, every time if i take a bow and i tune it to me with the right draw length the right draw weight the the right uh everything everything that needs to be set up in order for me to shoot that bow consistently straight and, and hit the target Sam picks that bow up, it's going to be completely different. He's not going to be able to, to shoot that straight every time just like I am. So that's that's one thing that I find really interesting about bow hunting is when you get a bow, it is your bow. It is specific to you. The other Another essential rule of owning a bow is friends don't let their friends shoot their bow. That's true. That I, I learned that the hard way. Your <laughs> bow falls apart sometimes if friends let friends shoot mm. their bows. That was a long time ago, but I learned that the hard way. Um and, and on that note of, of tuning also, because Nick, like Nick just said, these are specific to you guys. Um, like if you drop your bow off at a bow shop to get it tuned and you go to pick it up, bow tech hands it to you, yeah, it's good to go. Ask him if you can shoot it through paper. A paper tune is, is the way that we tell if that arrow is flying through that bow straight or not. Ask him if you can shoot that bow through paper because... He, like Nick just said, everybody shoots a bow different. He's going to shoot that bow different than you, and you're going to grip that bow different than he does. So he, he may get a perfect bullet hole going through paper, and then you go up there and shoot it, and it's completely different. So before you pay and take your bow away, ask that bow tech if you can shoot it. To One, to make sure that it, it is good, and two, to make sure that it's specific to you. Mm -hmm. So so I know you mentioned earlier um, – just tuning a bow, you could send three or four hundred arrows through it, right? Off of your <laughs> off of your initial tune. So, uh, with a brand new bow, you want to allow some time for your strings to break in, because mm -hmm. those strings 
are are put on that bow and very minimal shots at the factory are normally put through them so right. the strings stretch over time especially as they go is they're in warmer environments or or, or whatever but the strings stretch as you shoot it so sure. um, that three to four hundred mark is just kind of the reference point to where your strings are, are going to be pretty well broken so okay and and at that point you can do more of a permanent tune on the bow gotcha. one initial to get you started but then do a permanent tune on the bow I call it permanent. You should get your bow tuned at least once or twice a year, in my opinion. But you, after those first three or four hundred shots, you yeah. can kind of stick with it. You know? Okay. So, um, I was just going to touch on um, a lot of guys, even with rifle hunting, they get shooting anxiety. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, a tip that I uh, recently found was if you got shooting anxiety with your bow, one thing that you can do is you have your target set up. To uh, with a back stop to where it's not going to go anywhere. You stand four or five feet away from that target, uh-huh. and you draw back your bow. You get aimed at that target, and then you close your eyes, uh, and then you squeeze that trigger. So that way, you can get more comfortable with how that bow feels and how far your trigger pull is, uh, depending on what kind of release you have. Because there's several different type of releases. I know you mentioned earlier uh, that was one of the accessories that you need. There's a trigger release that you can use uh, that you put on your wrist that you can uh, just pull your finger back just like you're shooting a gun. Uh, there are thumb releases that are handheld. So that's, there's two different types of, of handheld releases in, in that, that are popular. Right. There, there's a thumb release and then there's a back tension release, mm-hmm. which I'm not, we're trying to keep this podcast at more of a basic level. I'm not even going to get into a what a back tension release is. It's it's pretty, it's, 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 it's base, not what yeah. you need to start hunting with, it, and and in my opinion, you don't even need to be hunting with it. You, it's more of a target archery thing. But talking about wrist strap versus thumb. Yeah. I shoot a thumb release. You shoot a wrist strap release. Yep. So, and what you're talking, and and I'll let you get back on on point here. But what you're talking about with with target panic and and knowing your equipment. What Nick's talking about is applicable to both thumb releases and For sure. wrist strap trigger releases. I mean, there there is it's it's a different way to do the same thing, mm-hmm. but the same concept that you're talking about here is applicable. Yeah, because even on the releases, you can set those to a certain a certain um, tension, a certain tension to where you pull it back a certain amount. You can lightly touch it and it'll go off, or you can. Yeah, you can make that thing. You can make that thing super sensitive, or you can make it to where you gotta you gotta move your thumb a mile to be able to to shoot your bow. So, but but what you're talking about with target panic, I I can attest to that. And what really helped me with, in my opinion, becoming better with knowing my equipment, to becoming better with my follow through on my shot, was the year that I shot competitively. Mm. Because I was shooting indoor, which if I had to shoot, if I, I haven't shot competition since that one year, unless it's just small little local competitions. But if I get back into it seriously, I'll probably be doing outdoor. But I shot indoor um, the year that I did shoot um, the state competitive uh, tournaments. And it's 20 yards, it's 60 arrows at a indoor target. Mm -hmm. And which doesn't sound that hard. But when you're shooting for a quarter size X, mm-hmm. it, it gets to you, yeah. and and it plays mind games. I remember there was one tournament I shot in, and in a nutshell, at the Siwat shoots, um, shoot your way across Texas. Um, the indoor shoot is 300 is basically a perfect score. A 360 X is a perfect score. Now I've never really come close to that 60 X mark, but I remember the first time I was on track to shoot a 300. I had five arrows left, and I was I was like if I if I shot a shot a five on each of these, I, I had my three hundred. That that's where I was. And first three arrows went down range, solid shots, <laughs> and I I let it get to me mm. mentally. I didn't just go out there and shoot my bow. I started thinking about it. Yep. And that next to last arrow, I shot. I I barely got a four. I almost <laughs> missed the whole target. Like that that's how much it got to me. So yeah. And shot anxiety, target panic, um, all that stuff is legit stuff. Yeah. And, it happens. And the best way to get over it is to go out and shoot. Mm-hmm. Whether it's 
challenging yourself to new stuff like competition shooting or like you say going out there at five yards and just arrow after arrow yeah, not worrying about where you hit just, how it feels. just yeah just going how it feels those are legitimate ways to to help conquer your fears and so when I worked at the at the bow shop, I worked as as a tech for a little while. But another thing they also helped out with, I was never like a certified instructor or anything, but I helped teach, um, especially like on the kids leagues and mm-hmm. stuff like that that the, yeah. the shop had. And like kids, man, they're they're the most excited, but they can also be their own worst enemy because <laughs> like they one shot they hit the hit the x hit the bullseye and they are jumping up and down they're pump and the next shot they completely miss and it kills morale <laughs> just the rest of the week just morale yeah. is gone and and so that that also kind of just from a teaching perspective it kind of helped me think about my own stuff a little bit differently and yeah. and help me with some of my own issues and i, and I know i'm kind of getting on a rabbit trail again but but that was uh that was another just another point so the last thing i'm going to talk about is a little bit farther on in in your process so you've been shooting for a while you're getting comfortable you've been hunting you've been killing deer you're you're getting good um you want the next challenge there's a lot of stuff out there that that can challenge you for me the thing that i found that really made me try to perfect my craft was western hunting and long range shooting shooting your bow at 70 80 90 100 yards that is a challenge yeah that is something that even now i do not consider myself perfected at i still there's always room for improvement but i got to the point where i was proficient enough to actually be willing to go out to montana and hunt pronghorn Mm -hmm. out there and two years ago 2018 I shot a I shot a stud. I got lucky is what I got <laughs> and shot him at 41 yards. Um, last year really brought things into more perspective and more what I need to be willing to do out there if I'm going to truly bow hunt these yeah. things, spot and stock. Um, one, Chester, who went with me, he had a shot at one where he missed at 41 yards. And one, it was because his target was moving. His target did not stop moving. Oh, really? So that was a reason that he missed. So we we sit there, and even at 40 yards, we shoot, and we're shooting at a, at a still target. We never think about what if that target's moving and yeah. I can't get it to stop. Am I going to take that shot? Yep. These are things to think about. Um, the other thing for me was long range because Chester had the one shot opportunity of the week. I had about a 70-yard shot, but I had brush in between me and me and the goat so i couldn't i couldn't let one fly Mm -hmm. the rest of the week the closest i got was 124 yards and (laughs) that's a shot with a bow right there (laughs) so normally like when i went up there 100 was my max i'll shoot it if it's under 100 i'll I'll fling an arrow that was that was my rule Hmm. i was so desperate by the fifth day when i was sitting there 124 yards away from this thing like thinking back i was legitimately considered <laughs> flinging an arrow and i'm like this is freaking crazy yeah i can't believe that this is my option yeah. that this is what i'm thinking about and you want to talk about something that will push you to be better is the fact that i i made the right decision i don't doubt that i did not make a try to make a 124 yard shot mm-hmm. when my bow is good for 100 but i came back and i was like i'm going back next year and I'm going to be ready to shoot a goat at 124 yards. <laughs> like that, yeah. that is ambition. Absolutely. That is pushing yourself to the next level. So, so what I'm trying to get at guys, I'm using that as an example to say that if you are, if you're getting the point where you're wanting more, you're getting hungry um, for more then find something like that yeah. to challenge you. Start shooting long range. And once you get proficient with 60, 70 yards, mm-hmm. then Go out there and hunt. Be willing to make that shot. I'm not telling you to go out there with the intent of making that shot. Yeah. If if I had if I had seen that go to 124 yards the first day, I would have been like, oh, no way, no way, yeah, never, yeah. Even at 100 yards, I probably would have been like, nah. <laughs> but day number five, next to last day, and I hadn't even gotten a shot. Oh yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about it. <laughs> so 
being willing to make those longer shots and then taking on the challenges of a new environment like Montana or or anything out there mm-hmm. um, out Midwest, that's taking it to the next level. Yeah, that that's sure. something that can push you farther and really really make you want to be a better archer. And once you do it once too, like and you know what's involved, it'll also push you to be better. Because yeah. like I thought I was prepared that first year, and like I said, I got lucky and killed one, but. I came back and I was like, next year I need to be a little bit better. Yep. And sure enough, I was. And awesome. this year I have the same mentality. Yeah. So that that keeps you motivated and keeps you going as well. Cool. So. Yeah, I know. And I know you mentioned range. Uh-huh. Uh huh. To is one thing that can push you to be better. I know Chester didn't think about what if it's moving. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Another thing that I've done to help me is um, when you're on the range and you're practicing with your bow. You're sitting there in a calm environment. Uh, your your heart's not racing. You don't have what they call buck fever. Yes. Um, one thing you can do is do some jumping jacks, do some push-ups, burpees, whatever. Get your heart going. Go run a lap and then come back and try and shoot that bow. Uh, and just to just to kind of closely mimic that that buck fever feeling of when your heart gets racing and pounding and uh, you got the shakes. You know, just try and because you're not going to be, I don't know about anybody else, but when I'm in that situation, I'm definitely not calm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, and not only your buck fever, but too, if, and, and I'm kind of stealing Chester's content here just because he's not here. But um, when you're like the pursuit of yes, Western hunting, yes. spot and stock, because that was another thing. And if you guys watch um, season four of our flagship series, Fall Obsessed Outdoors, which is now online, um, you will see this. He talks about this in that show is how unprepared he was for all the walking, yeah. all the running. Yeah. Cause you, you know, that, that goes into you getting, opportunity. Yeah, You're to getting in, to get in, to getting in position to be able to take advantage of an opportunity and you get up there and you're out of breath. Mm-hmm. You can't breathe. And all of a sudden you got to make a shot and you got to make that shot right now. Yeah, yeah. You know, so that, that's, an, that's another reason that what you're saying could be applicable there's also shoots throughout the country, um, some at a local level, some at a more national level, where that is the intent, mm-hmm. is to make you go up and down all these hills and go, you know, hundreds of yards in between targets just to to make you do that, yeah. to make you have a uh, be tired, have a high heart rate, and then have to make a shot. Yeah. So um, if, if you're wanting to do that, go find one of those shoots too. Yeah, that, that's a, absolutely. That's a, that's a, really that's good a fun practice. way to do it opposed to doing burpees in between each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you want to be fit too. Fitness no. is a big part of it too if you're going to do western hunting. And I, I won't go off on a fitness trail, but um, if it's if it's not a not a lifestyle um, that you're used to, yeah. um, then you need to think about it before you go western hunting because it's going gonna, it's gonna to challenge you if, if you're not used to that. So. Mm-hmm. Well, Nick, thanks for joining me, man. I I appreciate it. Oh, it's yeah. fun Anytime. to talk about bow hunting. Like I said, guys, this is we're trying to have a lot of diversity on our online content, but bow hunting we can't ignore that it is our bread and butter, and that a lot of people are into that. So this is this was a good topic to talk about. I hope that you guys got something out of this, and that we at least said something that's useful for somebody. Yeah. It wasn't just <laughs> us rambling on forever. Um, but I do encourage you guys. Um, to check us out online, go to our website, fallobsession.com. That's the hub for all of our stuff. Um, check out, I, please, if you're new into bow hunting, check out our Cure Your Obsession series. Um, that is going to be a huge and helpful tool that nobody else really has that, that you guys can use if you're just getting into bow hunting. We got some new bow hunting uh, apparel, some merch Oh yeah, on our online store. So go to fallobsession.com slash store and uh, pick you up at the bow hunting t-shirt and uh follow us on facebook instagram subscribe to our youtube channel also another really cool thing that we have now on our website on our podcast page is we are now letting you guys suggest a topic so if you guys have something that we have not talked about that you want us to to cover in a future episode you can now go to our website and you can suggest a topic and, and tell us um, what to talk about. Yep. So we're we're more than open to suggestions. We're in this podcast for the long run, so we're constantly looking for fresh content to have. So be sure that you go on our website and uh, and let us know what you're thinking and what you'd like to hear from yeah, us. Yeah, because we're so. here for you guys. Uh, that's what 
this whole thing is uh, is for is for our listeners. And so, if y'all have something that y'all want us to talk about, don't hesitate to go on there and let us know. Yeah, absolutely. And also, I know that Nick and I do a lot of these podcast episodes, but we got over thirty guys on staff, and we got a lot of friends and uh, partners in the industry that are very knowledgeable. So we got a lot of opportunities to bring special guests on in the future. So if there's a topic that is relevant to you that we may not be necessarily experienced in, I promise you we can find somebody that is and get them on the show. Absolutely. Subscribe to the podcast. Thank you guys for following. Thank you guys for listening. And we will catch you on next Monday's episode. See you later.